Oh, my God. All right. So we're on the air. This is live radio, everybody. And this is the Control Freak, and you're listening to CFRC. And it's the Indie Wake Up Call. And that was Thunder Glove. And I've got Greg on the phone. Are you there, Greg? I, I'm right here. Can oh you hear me? Oh, my God. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I need a producer. That would be amazing. Anyone want to volunteer to be my... Hey, I think this this worked out great. Oh. I mean, it's live radio. It's exciting. And Thunder Glove is in the great company, the Chats. I love the Chats. Oh, my God. I said before they came on, I'm like, they're the, one of the best bands in the world. Uh, they really Three. are. Oh my God! Yeah, three of three of us, three of the members of Thunder Gloves saw the chats uh, earlier this year. They were phenomenal. Have, oh. you, have you seen them live? No. Was that at Fafoon or where did you go? I saw them. Uh, it was at the Velvet Underground oh in Toronto. Oh my God! Okay, so no, like I was calling out. I'm like, are there any 14 year olds out there that want to go see the chats? Because I feel that that's who should be going to see the chats. Um, no, I have missed the chats. I know they came this past spring, like right in that little "Hey, we're back open again" phase. Ugh. And I mean, they're not going to come around again. They're from Australia. We'll get we'll get they them in a while. They've been here twice this oh year. Oh, my so God. You, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they're perfect for 14-year-olds. I have the intellect of a 14-year-old. I'm often told that. And when people tell me that, I actually take it as a compliment. So, yeah, the chats are perfect for me. Listen to us talking about the chats when, in fact, you are in a band called Thunder Glove that is going to invade Wolf Island this weekend. I already played Barbarian Queen for our listeners we just got to break this down. Like, I, I just, there's so much I need to know about what's going on. I just love that the weave put me in contact with you because he's a legend around here and I'll do whatever he says. Like, in terms of music, he's a god. So I love that this comes through the weave and our lo loved band, the Harachas. You're friends with those guys. Like, just break it down for me, though. Like, I know the story. The backstory is a little bit about the pandemic and some people like, like myself, I just like tried making sourdough bread and so on. But you did something else. What did you do? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd put, yeah, so the weave is awesome. And I played in the Toronto surf scene for a long time, and, and the Harachas did a few shows with them, an amazing band. But, uh, you know, I played all the usual suspect instruments, guitar, drums, and bass, and I always meant to play a synthesizer. Uh, and in the pandemic, I had the opportunity to finally get one and teach myself how to play it because there was nothing else to do. And I was saving lots of money by doing nothing. Got a pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, I got that synthesizer, started playing, and it just so happened that while I was teaching myself to play, I was c consuming a very steady diet of, of barbarian films like Low Rent, Conan Knockoffs, and it was one movie in particular, Deathstalker 2, that had this galloping, rousing, super catchy synth score, and it just sort of clicked. Like, what if I did a barbarian thing, and, and almost every song was a gallop and had this sort of goofy, rousing quality to it? And yeah, you can hear it in Barbarian Queen. Jessica Thunder is uh, she's just galloping on all the bass parts there, and and we did it. Yeah, I put out the first album just playing all the instruments, recorded it in lockdown, and then reached out to a few people I played with on the surf scene. And uh, the drummer was a guy I played with in a band called the Scream Majors. Got it all together, and we've done a bunch of great shows this year. It's been it's been a hell of a ride, and and we it's the authentic eight bit Barbarian experience. We're dressed in costume the entire night. We remain in character the entire night. We've had serious discussions about how we want to come across as barbarians, and, and we live it. It's not just it's not just a costume; it's a way of life. Well, I I love how some um, reviewers have described you as unclassifiable, um, indescribable, um, and that the audience is often left bewildered. I mean, those are good things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the bewildered thing, I, I did an interview with this uh, paper out in Niagara Falls when we were playing there. And yes, uh, I, I, I love that, right? We've done that, that. Our first big show was at the Baby G in Toronto. We were the middle act. Uh, and there was about 150 people there. And we made some new fans, but we certainly <laughs> bewildered a few people. And some people were just like, what the hell is going on? Amazing. I'd much rather have that reaction than just people being bored. Um, you know, I'd rather have people go home and say, oh, you should have seen Thunderglove. They were weird and horrible. Uh, you know, we're not showing up in a bunch of flannel shirts and blue jeans and singing songs that you'd hear in a coffee shop. It's, uh, it's a spectacle. So there was nobody, Eileen, there's nobody up sorry. front with their arms crossed, like just checking you guys out. You know, like there was nobody in the audience doing that. Cause that's, that is a musician. I often wonder, I'm like, that must suck. Like you probably just had a lot of other reactions than that, which yeah, is amazing. Yeah. It's you. Usually people look pretty amused, but when you see one of those two people, one of you know a couple people with their arms crossed, I I still think that means you're doing something right. Let the haters hate. That's good. If you're if you're doing something to irritate somebody, you're getting some kind of reaction out of them, which is 
in my mind, preferable to just being totally unremarkable. Friend, you're on the right show, okay? Um, I love that you're with local bands, Cacao and Jukebox Country, but how did you get this band together? It sounds like you've obviously in, immersed in a really positive community, and but was there ever a moment of pause of like, we're doing what? We're dressing as what? What's happening? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. I just did, I did this interview with YGK News the other day and was asked a similar question, and, and the guy, the reporter's name was Owen Fullerton. He was great. But he asked, he, he more politely said, you know, this sounds like a bit of a stupid idea. Did your friends <laughs> think this was a stupid idea when you approached them? And my response was basically, I only approached friends who I know enjoy stupid ideas. Uh, so, yeah, all, all my first choices were into it. Uh, and they're all like, yeah, the, the costumes are amazing. The enthusiasm is great. So we have Jessica Thunder on bass. And I played with her in a band called Lou Hour Die. That band is still going. I play bass in that band. She plays lead guitar. Uh, they're now going with a much better bass player than I'll ever be, so it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Uh, and we played with the Harachas a lot. And then uh, Trevor, I played with in the Von Dratz and Rocket XL5 and other surf bands. And uh, the drummer was Scott from the Scream Majors. I sort of all knew them, and I've known them all for more than 10 years, and I figured if a stupid idea is going to fly with someone, it's, it's these three people, and sure enough, it did. So let's go back to Conan for a second here. You guys recently played a tribute to the 40th anniversary of Conan the Barbarian in the movie. And does this bring out people who maybe aren't music fans necessarily, but they bring out the Conan fans? Like, how, how was that? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it is. So that was at the Review Cinema in Toronto, which just celebrated its 110th birthday in November. Um, so that's that predates the sound era in films, right? They've been around forever. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I've been going to review screenings for a, about 15 years, and it's the kind of place for, it's not necessarily movie snobs, because as, as you've probably already surmised, I'm pretty lowbrow. Um, but, you know, they just make movies into events. I go there multiple times a month, and they'll do special anniversary screenings. So, yeah, I reached out to the director of programming, because occasionally they have bands play at screenings. And it's just a band goes on for like 10 minutes before the movie starts and then the movie starts. But the review has just got this built-in fan base of like movie lovers who go there all the time. I think we probably drew between, we drew some number of people to it, but the thing sold out. So we were playing to 200 people. And yeah, it's pro primarily people who are just loyal patrons of the review and or Conan fans. So it was a wonderful opportunity for us to play in front of a room of people who mostly did not actually come to see us. Uh, which was great because we made a bunch of new fans and all these people who I didn't recognize were tagging us in their photos and videos after the set. But yeah, it, it was phenomenal. And I mean, we were built to play a Conan screening. I couldn't have hoped for something better. Certainly sharing the bill with Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't hurt the draw. That's right. But there's something about scores, though. Like, it, it clearly is something that drew you in. Like, I'm trying to think that rabbit hole that you were exploring during the pandemic when you got into these, not even the Conan movies, like it's the, it's the spin-offs of Conan that were lower budget, but what is it about those scores specifically? Like, cause they, when you watch them now, I mean, it doesn't seem to almost sound like they should fight with that music, but what, what is it for you that, that those scores mattered during that era? I, I think that, you know, with the Conan, there were many ripoffs of Conan, right? That were like, that, that happens to this day. You have a movie that's a hit and then, Dozens of movies trying to cash in on the same thing come out. But with this, you know, with all those low rent films, they were usually scored on synthesizers. This was the 80s. They were done pretty cheaply. And I mean, just because you're doing something cheaply and you're not John, uh, you know, you're not Basil Polidorus with a massive orchestra, doesn't mean that you can't come up with something good. And the, the good scores, Chuck Serino scored Death Stalker 2, which is really the movie that basically indirectly spawned Thunderglove. It's just, it's well-written music done on a synth, and it's, it's got this galloping, you know, it's got a galloping rhythm, so a lot of these songs are just evocative of, like, I picture riding into battle on horseback with a three-bladed sword. Like, I can picture myself doing that while listening to Barbarian Queen. I'm sure everyone listening to this show had the same thought running through their head. But, yeah, it's just sort of a, it's the, galloping is a huge part, and this sort of goofy, battle cry quality to it like a let's go let's get on that horse and, and go fight i you know some of those scores were really bad but the good ones are super catchy and the composers you know knew how to make the most of, of what they were doing and certainly i have my limitations being pretty new to the synthesizer but you know i've always said you know you don't actually need to be that talented to be great 
Well, if you're just tuning in, we're talking to Greg from Thunder Glove. They're going to invade Wolf Island this weekend. And um, I'm wondering, I mean, you have a surf community. I know that. Is there a barbarian music community? Like, are you finding your people? Well, you know, we call ourselves uh, Canada's premier barbarian band, and we're delighted when other people start calling us that. I think, realistically, we might be the only barbarian band. <laughs> okay. um, but I like inhabiting that spot. Uh, at the moment, we don't have any competition, really, in that space. And if we do, uh, eventually one day, then I guess that means we're doing something right. But I, I think, like, I don't know if there's going to be a whole barbarian scene. I think a lot of metal bands over the years have really, you know, adopted the barbarian look. And I know you know music, so you're probably familiar with John Michael Thor, the, the Canadian metal artist. Yes. Like, I certainly took a lot of my look from Thor. Um, and, and we love Thor. Like, I love his music. We sound nothing like Thor. Um, but aesthetically, there's certainly some inspiration happening there. But as far as a band that's just actually positioning itself as a barbarian band as far as i know we're the only one but i think it's you know some people are turned off by the idea of instrumental music certainly playing in surf bands for a lot of years i'd often hear comments from people who didn't get it asking where all the lyrics were um but this is just so goofy that i don't even think it matters if you have a preconceived you know, notion about music should have lyrics. If you see Thunderglove playing, you're not even going to care that there aren't any words. It's just a, it's a spectacle. And, uh, and I don't try to deny that this is the humorous endeavor that it is. We take the songs really seriously, and we think these songs are really good, but they're just sort of inherently goofy, you know? I think you that's... listen to Barbarian Queen, and you're like, this is, uh, I don't know, maybe you don't think it's the greatest song in the world. I think it's not bad, but it's pretty goofy and it's pretty fun. And we just try to make the whole night like that. Well, I would as I, far as the, go, yeah. ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I mean, like, I don't think there are any other barbarian bands and I'm actually fine with that. I, I, I like being the only one. OK, so this is a reminder for everyone to follow Thunder Glove on social media. And I just again, we're we're um, not it's not that we're warning Wolf Island that you're coming, but we're preparing everyone that you're going to be at Wolf Island on Saturday night. You're going to be there with Cacao and Jukebox County. We love those guys. So it's going to be a great time. Doors are at seven. And I did play Barbarian Queen leading in when I was like, where is he on the phone? I can't answer the phone, apparently. Um, so now I want to play Pulverizer. Is that all right? This is from the album. It's an EP, Taste the Power of Thunder Glove. Now, did you do this one on your own? Because I know your debut you did. But were your bandmates involved in the in the creation? of this album yeah so taste the power of thunder glove is all the entire band so yeah escape from hell mountain was just me in lockdown and this is this is everybody you're hearing amazing so everyone just be ready it's gonna be so good and i love i love the whole bill it's gonna be so much fun and i'm, I'm just so pleased you gave us a call this morning greg i know it's gonna be a good time so everybody check it out i'm gonna play some hey, pulverizer and greg you got anything else for my people or what I just want to say thanks so much for the opportunity, Cindy. It's been great talking to you. I hope to see some people out at Wolf Island on Saturday. All right. Here's Pulverizer with Thunderglove. And, uh, I mean, Thunderglove with Pulverizer. I'm having a tough morning talking this morning, Greg, but I feel the messaging is getting out to everyone. Thanks again. Here we go.